Hello and welcome to the Arden University Student Podcast for Brain Awareness Week 2023. Here we aim to further the Dana Foundation's campaign to foster public enthusiasm and support for brain science and to raise awareness of the links between psychology and brain sciences. In this episode, we are thrilled to be joined by some very special guests from the field of cognitive science. Dr. Maria Julia Hamida from Argentina, Dr. Roberta Racuni from Brazil, Dr. Juan Vale Lisboa from Uruguay, and Dr. Marcos Vinicius Alves from Brazil. These four outstanding researchers are passionate about raising awareness of the importance of better understanding cultural context, and specifically the Latin American one, which is sadly plagued with many challenges, including the prevalence of low, low socioeconomic status. Together, they have assembled a book detailing the links between cognitive sciences and education from a Latin American perspective and highlighting the urgent need for greater diversity in neuropsychological research. Please feel free to listen to the episode in its entirety or or alternatively, you can scroll straight to the chapters which interest you the most. Either way, we hope you enjoy. So welcome everyone. Um, To start off, uh, I was hoping that one of you could explain us a bit um, the motivation and the necessity that brought forward uh, this piece of work. Uh, As you you know, I'm the the first author of the the book. And uh, basically what happened was that Spring asked me to write a book about anything I wanted. And uh, I was uh, in Europe. I was living in Europe, working at the University of Luxembourg. And I was really, really annoyed by the thing that is that people, uh, researchers and students, they don't really know what happened in Latin America and what happened in the South, global South. So I was, I wanted to talk more about our results or necessities or uh, difficulties doing research and understanding some some of the cognitive models. Because when we are trying to put this kind of attention, memory and everything in uh, in a Latin American perspective, we start to think that basically some of these things doesn't work when we're trying to uh, work with s- such different people, you know, cultural difference when I say this. So I start to think about this book and invite, I invite uh, Roberta, and after that, we invite Juan and uh, Maria Julia that you already, you know, talking to. So we start to think we wanted a book that uh, would show um, top researchers from Latin America, but also talking about education that is something really important here. And of course, with using the cognitive neuroscience perspective, because usually when we see this in uh, Latin America, you see more in a social perspective, but we wanted to talk about cognitive psychology in neuroscience. So basically what we we were thinking when we started the book was we want to show to research students and professors that when we think about cultural differences, you need to point that, okay, so the US, the UK, Europe, you have you have a nice place to live, to work, to study. But when you think about Latin America, we have a lot of changes, that, cultural change that will also affect the way our cognition works. So that's the main, main thing. When you if when you read the book, you will see a lot of works that 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 show uh, people that are strictly different from the ones you will see uh, in the north. Uh, so you will see people from the global south that is that they are. You know, passing through some difficulties. Not everyone, but some people, and also indigenous population and uh, uh, Afro-descended women. Uh, I must say, uh, I'm from. I'm, I'm right now. I'm working in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, but I'm from Salvador. Salvador is a city in Brazil that is a, a really nice city. I, I love Salvador, but Salvador has is the Salvador is the uh, largest 
I, I don't think I don't think it's the worst, but it's, it's the people with most black descendants outside Africa. You can check me on that, but I, I think I'm I'm right here. So we will have a lot a lot of Afro descendant people here. And uh culturally we are also Latino. So we have Latinx people, Afro descendant people that are not being, you know, understand people when you do research with Western, rich, educated, you're not thinking about that. So right now, uh, we thought that the world, you know, that the research needed some some of these uh, examples, some some of this um, population represented. So that's the main reason. Like most children participating in studies came from the global north. Uh, mm -hmm. And we know almost nothing about children and how children are being educated and raised uh, and what are the contexts in which those children develop in the global south. Uh, but paradoxically, we have uh, really good labs, really good people working, really good stuff uh, about sci cognitive science, neuroscience and education in the global south. So, it's a pity that the rest of the world uh, can't see that. So the objective of this book was just to visibilize, to make visible our work. We had this idea that that we have these labs working together, and we met during one of our uh, Latin American schools of education, cognitive and neural sciences. Th that's what brought us together, and and we realized that that what Julia was saying that. There's a lot of potential in the in the global south, um, and so we say, okay, for the for the good of also of cognitive science itself, we need uh, to communicate what we're doing because the the richest uh, one of the most diverse parts of the world is, uh, for instance, Latin America. So if you have a good theory of how you learn, how you, you brain processes and, and cognitive processes are going on, it should work also for for this this type of diverse populations. And, and actually this hasn't been tested really in the, I mean, there's a, a, a global interest in, in doing that, but we're there. I mean, we're here, we are working together with the, with the diverse populations. And I think there are many things that we can add to the, to the corpus of cognitive science and, and even, um, you know, um, change some of the viewpoints that the, the, the area has about how, what learning is, how it entails and how to, uh, further education and, and, and learning. Amazing. And when you say um, change some of these viewpoints, do you have an example of uh, research that um, you read or conducted that has maybe changed some of the traditional views in cognitive psychology or neuroscience that comes from this Latin American perspective? Well, in our own research, a, a little bit of a, a piece of, of what I'm saying is that for instance, in the traditional studies relating um, the, the predictors of how learning to read and, and how, how you should teach how to learn to read, uh, it is clear that most of the studies have been done in English. And English has a very uh, non-transparent orthography, opaque orthography, which leads to different... Um, I mean, the... the the ideas or the predictors or the factors that are required for learning to read, at least the basic part of learning to read, the coding, are the same, but the, the, there are strong differences in, in the weight of these factors um, due to differences in orthography. For instance, in Spanish, that it's one of the languages we speak here, um, uh, you, you have a, a very transparent writing system so make which makes um, um, learning the the grapheme phoneme correspondence is the most important part, and that 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 what we have shown is that even um, phonological awareness, which is a, one of the classical predictors of reading, is is like developing at, at the same time as, as you're learning to read here, which is not the same that happens in English because in English you you first learn this correspondence, and then you you start developing um, graph. Um, uh, phoneme um, consciousness, I mean, like uh, phonemic uh, uh, phonemic awareness, and from from that, you you after that, and, and a laborious uh, learning process because the, the 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 writing system is 
so opaque, you eventually learn how to read. So, but so the the these predictors are you you go to to look for what children know before starting to read uh, to learn to read. And in in English, you see, okay, if if these children have a phonological awareness well developed, then they will read better. But you don't see that in in Spanish. In Spanish. Either you don't you know how to read or you don't, and in and what predicts better is the you know the sounds of letters and you know uh, rapid automatized naming, which is another predictor of reading. So there are differences, and 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 what you have to do or what you have to emphasize or what you have to to you know look for in, in when when trying to to further to promote learning how to learn learning how to read. I mean, and this is not very well known. I mean, we, we tend to usually here we tend to look at the north. So we, we're waiting for them for the north to, to tell us, okay, this is how you, things should be done. And and I think that this kind of research shows that there are some differences, and that that we can discuss that with the the other uh, writing systems. And that's what's one example that we have. But there are many, I think. No, thank you for sharing. That's a really great example of uh, languages and how that affects the science that has been done in, in psychology. Um, to go a bit back to the title of the work, um, you mentioned cognitive sciences and education in non-weird populations. Could one of you tell us a bit more about these weird concepts? What is the acronym and why is it so crucial? Uh, the weird concept is uh, Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. Yes. Okay, so, and uh, basically it entails that we are trying to see outside the box, in the box uh, means Europe and North America, basically. So, of course, I'm, it's a, it's a, I'm kind of... Uh, simplifying it, but, but the thing is we are trying to see you outside the box. And that's important because if you if you check most of the psychology research in the world, you will see that basically uh, it uses psychology students. So psychology students are the, the population that are more, the sample more uh, used in research. So I, I, I'm a professor of psychology. I like psychology students, but I don't, I don't want to know that much about psychology students. I want to know about people. Yes. So if you don't, if you don't research people, you're not doing a great research. So that's basically the concept. Mm -hmm. Where I'm not saying that <laughs> the other people don't do great research, but I'm saying that some people need to do great research outside this, this, this sample outside this, this group. Well, like it, it is not uh, for sure that all the people living in the global south live in a, in a non-educated country for sure not but uh, well let's say that this acronym uh, was it's generally used to make that difference between having or not having resources right thank you for sharing um and then if we look at this chapter that you wrote on the latin american perspective there is mention of how there's different research fields that over the more recent years have come closer together and interacted like cognitive psychology and education and neurobiology. And I was wondering if you could explain us a little bit about what these collaborations have showed us and how these interactions can inform us to improve society and uh, yeah, to support diversity. Well, I, I, I'm a neuroscientist, of, of course, so I, I will say that it's the most important thing. <laughs> because, see, when we are talking, when we are, you know, teaching, when we are writing something, we are, we are experimenting with cognition every time. Right now, we are talking here, so we are talking cognition uh, with cognition. My attention, my memory my language with your attention, your memory, your experience. So uh, neuroscience and psychology needs to understand that if we don't talk cognition to cognition, we won't understand what happens in people's mind. And basically that's why it's important. So when we talk about sleep and when we want to do a, a, a public health change, right? We don't say, oh, 
okay, let's change um, how long the class takes. Not two hours, not one hour. Let's do 50 minutes. We were talking about attention, how people can, you know, manage and put resources to, to understand something. When I say, uh, when I when I teach in, and I use people experience to 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 teach, I'm talking about cognition, I talk about memory, I talk about semantic memory. Think about it. Let's say that I will that I, I'm going to UK and I will teach uh, to you, and I start to use examples that are only from Brazil. You will say, okay, I, I get it, but I can relate with that. I can understand what's happened. So I need to understand what is important to everyone so I can do that. And how this kind of things works in our cognitive function. So this is one thing. Another thing is, I know that is not a good thing, but when we talk about neuroscience, when we talk about science uh, uh, in general, we have a more hard evidence. We have a we have a, you know stronger case uh, to present to politicians, for example. So we have uh, we have experience that is really really uh, was really strong here in, in in Salvador, right? We work with uh, uh, in a in a community that has uh, manganese leaking. So it's a extreme uh, dangerous metal in the in the in the water. So children there were affected by the manganese and they were losing working memory, executive function, attention. A lot of people try to talk with politicians about the, this case, but when we gave to them, see, you see, we are talking about brain damage here, almost brain damage, they start to believe us. So we have a stronger case when we use science, when we use this kind of data. So it's really important to neuroscientists and psychologists to do this kind of work. Not only our friends of uh, social science, they are, they are really important, but we also have this kind of importance when we talk about this. And uh, basically what I'm saying is, in fact, I'm saying that we need to work together, everyone, and we need to do a part. Sometimes neuroscientists don't do their part. They don't want to know about this kind of things. They think that, oh, it's too social. But we are social beings. We need to think about the other. Right. I, I would add that, you know, that um, this is a, a long tradition. I mean, this is connected. I think that the neurosciences that work better for education are those that are connected to psychology and and. and developmental psychology in, in a sense so, and so this is a in a it's a, a continuation of a tradition that started with Piaget and Vygotsky and and they wanted to know how the people learn and there they have many differences in that how they see each other and and the current I think that the current science is quite different from what they they thought it was but they they were the founding fathers in a sense and we are continuing that tradition and con, uh, you know uh, questioning many of the, their own uh, hypotheses and, and, and theories, but at the same time, building on, on top of them to, to, to understand better how we learn. Uh, and, and you cannot, I mean, there's, a, this, there's this discussion that, that some people say, okay, what you need to learn or to, to applicate for in education is not um, neuroscience is psychology, and so this the, there's this idea of a bridge too far. Uh, a famous paper by John Brewer in 1997 saying that neuroscience was too far from education, and that th there were no uh, real developments. I mean, uh, scientific uh, ideas that go from neuroscience to education without going through psychology. But I would say, and and I think that John Brewer would say that because it was one of the, the, the main forces behind our Latin American schools, that nowadays the, the psychology of learning is not that separated from neuroscience. You, you, you go, you have a psychologist doing a, a MRI to understand how the brain stores information. And so we have basic fa facts, maybe Roberta could talk about, like say testing effect and, and those kind of effects that are, that are really robust and really important for education. And, and you can say, okay, you don't need a, an MRI to, to, to prove that. But sometimes you need an MRI to understand how things depend on several factors or how 
how to, I mean, you start a, a new program and, and you don't, you don't want to wait for, the, I don't know, several years to see if it's working. You can see that there are some changes that go, are going on on the brain. And, and so you can be sure that it's affecting the brain somehow. Also, there are many areas of neuroscience that, that can, uh, that are very, really important. For instance, uh, sleep research. I mean, people studying uh, um, how people sleep and dream have shown very important things about uh, memory consolidation and learning. And this leads to, to the creation of new uh, avenues for research. There's a fairly recent paper by Siddhartha Ribeiro's group showing that if you have children, you, you teach them, say, uh, phonological uh, correspondences, uh, graphene phoneme correspondences, and then you can do either two things, uh, let them sleep or have another class. And and what comes from uh, sleep research is what they show is that sleeping a little bit, having a nap after what you've learned, is better than trying to learn again. So, and this is somewhat unexpected in, in a sense in the traditional psychological literature. You, you, I mean, you you might have that idea, but this comes from studies of of, of how people dream and what is what's the function of sleep, sleep and dreams and and that that's really important. Also, it's important there, for instance, the the um, the idea that that we need to protect the the sleep uh, of people. That it's like like a public health issue that you, people need to have the, uh, uh, sufficient sleep. And we have problems here in South America. Especially here, I mean, in Argentina and Uruguay, I guess that the the teenagers are the the, the are having a huge uh, sh uh, social shed lag, what they call social sleep lag. Like they go to sleep very late, and they have to go to high school early in the morning, and this creates a lot of problems. and And there are some many many studies coming from this area, both Argentina and Uruguay, and also Brazil, showing that these are really uh, important issues for learning. And so that this is. This shows that it's not just you, 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 you have to go always through psychology. You have some areas that come from traditional neuroscience and the neuroscience of sleep that can help you or, or the neuroscience of other things that, that can help. And because they are really intertwined with uh, psychology. And I, one last thing I want to say, I don't want to monopolize the, the word I, you know, talking, but is that, of course, no one's saying, and we're not saying that uh, this combination of, of of disciplines is the 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 only thing that needs to be addressed or used or or have to even have to uh, define how you do the education. Education is a social activity that requires many other things, like the infrastructures, curriculums, um, teacher training, and uh, I don't know how you build your, your your high school or your school. There are many things that. But this, in, in a way, this is similar to what happens in medicine. I mean, no one's saying that uh, uh, um, cell biologists should tell uh, a medical doctor what he or she should do. I mean, you, you have a, you, you know, you can create a drug that that uh, com uh, kills uh, cancer cells. But this is not medicine. You need many other things, and and especially you need a randomized controlled trials to show that this is a good drug in the, in the real sense. So we are not saying that neuroscience or neuroscience combined with psychology is, is alone is sufficient for education. What we're saying is a, a very important field, which is cognitive neuroscience, that require it, it should be uh, part of the teacher training in a sense. In the same vein of. Uh, teaching the teachers about Piaget, Vygotsky, and all the classical ideas, because the classical ideas are, are the field doesn't believe them. Uh, uh, they are not, uh, no, no scientific theory goes un unchallenged uh, after several years. So uh, this is not uh, an exception. So there are many things that change from Piaget and Vygotsky to, to these days. And we know that, and I think that that should be part of the, the teacher training and sense that you had you should know the science of learning and there's a, a, a thing called the science of learning what we are adding is that science of learning should look more or take more into account what happens outside the central countries because maybe some of the theories are not exactly general or completely valid sometimes uh teachers can misunderstand what neuroscience says about um how can we improve learning? So it's important for them to know 
like what is a scientific method what uh, is a research uh, how can we translate what we find on the labo laboratory to the real classroom environments because otherwise they start to do like weird stuff <laughs> in the classroom you know it's so true that there needs to be like a scientifically evidence-based informed education would be the ideal that's that's so valid definitely um you mentioned already a few characteristics from latin america such as like spanish language instead of english language and juan just mentioned this um social jet lag of teenagers who are getting too little sleep are there any other um specific cultural or social characteristics that spring out that have challenged some common concepts within these fields in comparison to like traditional English research? Yeah, I have two things to mention here. The first is uh, that another example can be poverty. Um, I think that when the, in the global north, they uh, made uh, the comparison between low socioeconomic status anything, any person living in low socioeconomic status versus middle socioeconomic status. The low socioeconomic status has nothing to do with the low socioeconomic status in Latin America. The characteristics are completely different. Even in inside each Latin American country, there might be different kind of poverty, but uh, I think that the studies, even some things might be similar. There are some factors that are usually considered in literature that here are not uh, significant. For example, in the States, to measure socioeconomic status, one important factor, if you get or not divorced from your husband. I don't think in Latin America this is an important aspect. Even, I would say it's the opposite. In the in the lower socioeconomic status uh, populations, the women that get divorced are usually the women that can sustain themselves because they, they, they work. So the, the opposite, the lower socioeconomic status is the people who is divorced. <laughs> not always, not generalizing, but for sure what is a predictor in one society can't, can't uh, not necessarily as a predictor in another. So poverty is, to me, another issue. And I would like to bring this point. Maybe we can take it off if it doesn't make any sense. But I have just come from Europe. I stayed there one month visiting people, going to meetings, congresses, seminars, may, mainly in child development, like in neuroscience education, but child development. And I think this is not something opposite between where and non where societies, but it's something complementary. The, the researchers in the global north are mostly interested in discover the natural law of child development. All the experiments they conduct are uh, linked with uh, saying what, what, what's the difference between human and young human primates, primates or how any behavior emerge in a baby and there, there's a lot of stuff really amazing interesting in stuff of the puppets and the children babies looking at the puppets in the scenery uh, all the experiments like that that on the end and trying to understand the natural law of learning of development in the global south maybe because our context we are mostly interested in interventions. I was really surprised. I was in a congress in, the, in Europe with, I don't know, 400 presentations, and I found only two intervention studies between 400. In Latin America, most researchers are interested in, uh, at the end, conducted an intervention study, like so I would say that the biggest interest in the global north is uh, linked to experience the expectant plasticity, but in the global south is a bit more linked with experience 
dependent plasticity. Like we in Latin America are really interested in how context influence all those variables. Uh, it, it doesn't not it do, does not mean that in the in the global north they are not interested. But I think that we have conducted a lot of research here that is really complementary of uh, this other research more focused on the natural law of development. Just to mention an example, uh, I think in Latin America it's almost impossible not not to control for socioeconomic status, but there are a lot of research in Europe or the States or Canada that do not control for that. Mm. It's just not in a variable of interest. Maybe because in the context, the variable do not make influence. It's not a critique. It's just a difference. I would add that, that we are, there are some, some people from the North that are trying to conduct studies in a third world uh, countries. I mean, like there's some huge... Uh, you know the Esther Duflo. She's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and she she's a, a specialized. I mean, she, her prize was related to especially conducting randomized control trial for for um, um, public policy. And so there's some a, 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 a linkage between them and, and people from cognitive science trying to do that. But in order to 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 understand how this works, and and I think that that Julia points to a very important point, which is that. Uh, a, if you have a good, I mean, I would say that even if, if you think you have a good theory about the how cognitive development occurs, you, you should be able to show that in a in an intervention. So this is the the the, the final test, and and there are some tests that have failed, for instance, or or have not shown the the result, the expected results. I wouldn't say fail, but there are some studies related to say um, mathematical cognition that say, okay, if you, for instance, um, enhance the approximate number system uh, sen sensitivity or the, its precision, you will impact mathematics. And there are some studies, previous studies have shown that there's some effect about that. But if you, if you see the huge studies with all the diversity, you see that that's not the case. So why is not the case? I mean, theoretically, even for the, if you want to understand how the brain works and how the mind works and how you learn how develop, developing occurs. So uh, you need to, to go to these studies and, and you may not have the diversity to test your, your theories in outside the, the I mean, um, in the, in the weird countries. I mean, the weird countries are very, very homogeneous in uh, many aspects. And so maybe this, there are inter, complex interactions between um, having different contexts and, and how, how you learn or, or, or develop. I mean, um, there are others related to executive function. Uh, what is executive function? It's a, a complex a set of concepts, I would say. I'm not a specialist in, in that, but there are some chapters in the book um, we have. And... Um, we tend to think of, of for instance, the, the capacity to delay gratification as a as a mature, um, um, developed, uh, what, what we want to have. But maybe if, if you live in another context, maybe the, the delay of gratification is not so good. So maybe your 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 executive executive functions adapt to your environment in a sense that that you're you're more ecologically uh, functioning. You know that. You don't need to see any everything as a as, as a pathology or as a uh, you know maybe there's something that you are you're being adaptive to the particular context you're living in. So and that changes the way it changes the way that you approach how to deal with that. I maybe mean, our own our symbolic uh, industrialized uh, educated world requires that you have certain uh, cognitive capacities that maybe are not being useful in another environment. We have a lot of diversity here in, in, in Amazonia, for instance. You have tribes, you have tribes that, that live in a, in, a, in a state quite different from the, the state of, that we live in the Western societies. I mean, we have Western societies here. We, we, I'm here and this is not different from a, a building, a, 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 I would say, in Paris or London or New York. But there are some other places here in, in Latin America, but all, in other, other places in, of the world, that they have quite different lives. And there's, there are some special uh, studies that 
take advantage of that. And I think that that's another important part of Latin America. You can do studies with the whole, uh, not the whole, but a, a, a biggest range of, of human variation that can show you what are the, the special properties of, I mean, the common properties of the human populations and the, the, the properties that depend on the cultural and even environmental context that can play and change the, the way you learn and develop. Just, just to give just a little uh, short example, other example of that, there are also some, il some illnesses that are particular from our countries. The, 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 uh, for example, the uh, illnesses of poverty or uh, neglected diseases such as dengue, Zika, chikungunya, that can have impact important, very important impacts for learning. Children, uh, that when mothers are uh, have Zika, they can have the children with huge uh, problems for development and learning. So, but these illnesses are not important in the global north. I particularly can say that I have some works on that the two journals in the global north, and the rejection was, we are not interested in this, that issue. So, That's a very simple example <laughs> that, that can show you that uh, sometimes uh, thing, uh, uh, health problems as, as Zika, which can have an important impact on child development, Roberta can tell you more about that in Brazil, uh, are completely or mostly ignored uh, by some journals in the in the especially psychology, neuroscience, and cognitive science journals in the Global North. But not only uh, when we have a, a specific uh, like uh, works like on Zika virus or stuff like that, but also uh, sometimes we, uh, they say, oh, we, uh, you should publish on a Latin American journal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they directly say we are not interested in stuff like that, like in things that happen far away from here, we are not interested. In your illnesses, we are not interested. That, that. But we think that uh, for sure, this is not all the community. I don't want to generalize. There's a lot of people not only interested, uh, really conducting, people in the global north conducting uh, research and stuff like that. But uh, this is just an example to show how Some problems are seen as something particular of this region, and the global north is not interested in hearing much about them because I think because they, they think they will not be affected by them. Very But strong, but very good. Should be interested in looking for the truth, independent in, <laughs> of that, where that truth uh, happened. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I was wondering, Julia, could you tell us more about in what ways poverty affects a child's social developmental opportunities? Um, you touched already a bit on it, but uh, I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, poverty affects uh, child development opportunities in almost all the possible ways in which you can affect opportunities. Uh, educational opportunities, health opportunities, and wherever. But uh, to be a bit more deep on the answer, there are two main mechanisms that have been proved uh, by which poverty exerts uh, those effects. The first is stress. Uh, it's supposed that uh, low socioeconomic status populations live under huge stress every day, and uh, learning and developing under can be uh, really hard. Your body, your mind, your brain is almost uh, taken by, not by all, but it's taken in a huge part to deal with that stress So all your resources, biological and cognitive resources, uh, are less available to learn. Uh, it does not mean it can change. For sure, you can change that situation. Avoiding stress or dealing better with the stress uh, can avoid that impact. It's not that if you are born in a poor home, 
will not learn. Not for sure, it's not like that. But it's a way in which you, in which being poor, reduce your opportunities of learning. And the other main way is uh, through language and educational opportunities. Children from mothers uh, who has who have a more educational, higher educational levels tend to have higher development in the typical developmental tests and that's uh, because uh, mothers have better jobs they have more time to play with their children they have more they can make a higher demand higher, higher cognitive demand plays or games with their children they have more materials to educate at home and, well and stuff like that but i could say that those are the main ways in which poverty can affect life opportunities and developmental opportunities of children. Right. Yeah, that's quite extensive, actually. And I was wondering, could you also tell us a little bit more about, um, you looked at some interventions that have been found to reverse some of these negative effects of poverty. Um, also at the brain level, you've mentioned some studies in um, this chapter. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, how to reverse some of these effects, which is probably so, not so straightforward. So, yeah, there are various ways of reverse those effects. But just to be in agreement with my previous question, I would say that there are two. One of them is the reducing stress. And one very useful way in which you can do that is just giving money to mothers. In a recent study conducted by Nobel and collaborators published this, uh, this year, it was demonstrated that mere cash transfer, that is giving monthly predictable money transfer to mothers, not not a small transfer, a transfer that really can improve your quality of life, reduce uh, all the impacts uh, of poverty in babies' brain, in their baby, baby's brain. So, of course, one way of reducing those effects is just avoiding poverty or avoiding stress by avoiding the economical pressure on poor families. And the other ways are educational ways. Uh, to deal with the other way in which poverty make a uh, So improving the quality of education uh, and improving the time uh, in a school, for example, preschool period is still not uh, mandatory in some Latin American countries and probably not uh, in some uh, countries across the world. So yes, the, the the best quality of education you have and the higher time you spend in school, for sure, will you make, uh, will increase your probabilities of success in school and in general life. So that's the other way in which we can deal with those poverty. Or we can reverse those poverty effects, improving education. And there is a lot of, there are some stuff also showing that if you train some cognitive processes in children. Also, their brain effects of poverty are reduced or uh, disappear. Right. No, that's really nice to see these two sides of like reducing poverty, the cash, uh, but also the educational side of um, how to reverse these effects of poverty. And could you also maybe tell us a little bit about the different contexts that you looked at, like the rural and the more urban context and how this can affect uh, child development differently in Latin America? Yeah, I would say uh, the short answer is that uh, we have to say that poverty in the global north and the global south is different, but also inside the global south, uh, the poverty is different, not only between countries, but also inside each country. So, for example, in my country, in Argentina, rural and urban poverty are completely different. Uh, poverty in urban places is more linked with the stress and predictability, insecurity. Poverty in rural settings is more linked to lack of access to resources from the state. Uh, and if I compare which of these ones 
this, which of those kinds of poverty are is more, more risky? I would say that rural poverty is much more risky for child development in the sense that not having access to to public resources, health, education, it's really detrimental for child cognitive development. Uh, if you are poor, but you live in a city, at the end you can find some help in uh, in a hospital nearby. But if the main, if the 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 first hospital you can arrive is uh, two hours by bus, and you can pay for that, so for sure your development is will be the opportunities for your development will be much more lower. So rural poverty is really something we should address right now. Urgent. It's an urgent issue. Also, extreme poverty is concentrated in rural places. It's my, uh, poverty in urban places is not so extreme. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's an urgent issue, issue for us. That sounds really valuable. Thank you so much. Uh, on the chapter retrieval practice, um, Roberta, um, you collaborated on this uh, chapter and I wondered to if you could tell us a little bit about what retrieval practice is and what its value is a little bit more generally speaking. So, but, uh, so before I answer what retrieval practice is, um, I like uh, to say uh, something for the students. Uh, normally, they say like, um, teacher, I know the answer. For instance, they are doing a test and they say, I know the answer. I studied really hard for this test, but I can't uh, remember. I can remember the page of the book. I can remember, I can visualize the content, but I can retrieve the information. So. And then I say, what do you mean about study really hard? You know, normally students uh, st uh, study like trying to put information inside their heads, like reread the, the notes. Uh, they try to rewatch uh, the lectures and they do uh, a strategy to try to put the information inside their head. So, uh, retrieval practice is the opposite. What if instead of uh, trying to put information inside their heads, what about uh, trying to retrieve information, to put the information out of their heads? That, that, that's something Pujar Gawal uh, always say in, the, their, uh, in her lecture. So retrieval practice is the effort is the the attempt the tentative of trying to retrieve to take the information to remember uh, the content that you studied, and the value of this strategy is that it promotes long term memory, long last learning, and uh, it facilitates uh, learning new contents. Uh, it's like a, uh, how can I say it's a a one of the best strategies to for the students to use in their daily life in the everyday uh, in their study ab like I study ab habits. I'm sorry. Right. No, thank you. And could you also tell us a little bit more? You looked at uh, retrieval practice studies in Latin America. Um, could you tell us a little bit uh, about what you find there um, compared to what has already been uh, seen in Western kind of societies? So, uh, uh, as we talk about uh, the, the importance of uh, trying to uh, study uh, no weird population, uh, one study of uh, Puja um, shows that uh, she revealed a uh, retrieval practice in real classroom environments. And out of the 37 studies, only three was from no weird population. So only three. Uh, so it, it's important to study, not uh, to show, to see if the uh, this strategy also works in all the populations. So uh, not only in no weird population, but, but in diversity. So, it works for all the culture, 
because uh, sometimes, uh, oh, I, I prefer to study like that because, um, for instance, here in Brazil, uh, it's really common what the teacher do a lecture and uh, student normally listen and participate of the lecture. Uh, other countries, it's really common, uh, more debate. Uh, in uh, Japan, for instance, they, it's common like the, the professor have do the lecture and and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, so it's important to study not only the weird population, but also diversity populations. Like, uh, does uh, retrieval practice works for children, for not only for college students, like the most uh, parts of the research was made from uh, college students. So it worked really well for college students, but how about in basic education? How, how about in children? How about um, in younger, uh, in adolescents? So we have to see what, uh, if uh, this strategy uh, is also worth to be teaching, uh, to be taught for other students as well. So how would you see within Latin America the, the application of retrieval practice? Do you, how do you see the value of it um, within Latin America? Okay, so uh, for instance, Brazil is one of the, has one of the lowest rank of education position in PISA. PISA, how can I say in English? It's PISA? It's PISA? Yeah. I don't know, we say PISA uh, here. So uh, the uh, if we uh, can teach uh, an, an intervention that students can use in the, the daily uh, lives in their classroom, like uh, I can teach, I can study like that and that will improve my learning and that will make uh, my uh, learning less Less so uh, we can improve uh, like their uh, their knowledge about what they need to know in this school, not only for school but for uh, for their their life. So if they stood by retrieving information, they can improve their uh, learning. So we can like uh, make. Um, a better uh, way to uh, improve, like learning in general, you know. Mm. Right. Yeah, it's a really good point. Essentially, what I hear is that uh, to teach the students learning strategies to become more efficient in picking up the benefits of education. Mm -hmm. That sounds really valuable. Thank you so much. Here in Latin America, it's not common that teachers say okay, you have to study that way. It's like, oh, they leave just up on each student how to study. Isn't it, Roberta, or I am wrong? Yes, uh, we, we ask for uh, some teachers uh, if they teach how, uh, how to, uh, if they teach the student how to study, they, they don't. And, and we ask uh, what about the top strategy like what's the better strategy that a student can use and they don't know what is evidence based so they uh, they also say that uh, uh, oh they have to reread the chapter and uh, they st to study in uh, techniques that trying to put the information inside their head oh please rewatch the the lecture reread your notes but it's not um, uh, what research shows is that when we compare a student that stood by retrieving the information versus by rereading the information, a student uh, who uh, retrieved the information learns more than the the ones who reread the information. So, but the children are not uh, the all uh, students and professors, educators are not aware of this effect. So we have to raise like conscience about uh, what is important to do when you study. Mm. Amazing, yes, yeah, like a big shift of like putting awareness on how to learn instead of like, what are we learning? Like, how are we uh, learning at our best, essentially? That's super valuable. Thank you so much. To move further um, to the book, Juan, 
um, you collaborated on this chapter uh, looking at technolo technology. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit about the value of technologies to make a difference in settings where access to resources such as electricity and internet is actually not that reliable? Well, that's an interesting question because technologies need to have uh, or sometimes depend on um, internet and you know electricity. There are some moves, in particular, I, I live in Uruguay, and we had this one laptop per child initiative covering the whole country. So every child that goes to school, received to public school, receives a computer or tablet, and the schools have um, access points for children to have uh, access to the internet. But our country is really easy to do so. There were some programs in, in Argentina, and they had the, the same uh, strategy, but Argentina is huge and, and much more diverse. So it's not simple to, to cover all the country with that. So um, what we did, I mean, what, what people try to do here is to have the, the tablets or computers have the main things that you need to run inside and only use the internet when you need to download something or, or um, change the... The, the software installed in the, in the tablet. But what we've learned is that first that you need to use them in the, these are tools, this, this is not magic. There's no, this idea that you you know, the, the hole in the wall that you can put a television and children will learn, that doesn't work. I mean, from my perspective or from what I've read, I mean, it's very difficult that just dropping the technology would make uh, things work, which was a fantasy, not, not um, I would say that many of us had like, okay, let's give them technology with a, a, a important, well done uh, programs, and that would work. That, that doesn't work. When you need humans, I would say fortunately. Um, but but technologies are very important. I mean, they, they can, uh, if if properly used, they they can really really enhance education, and 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 make it and make it. Um, I mean, technologies are very important for many things. And, and, I, and there's a very famous uh, nowadays singer in Argentina who, who learned how to record music uh, using a Conectar Igualdad uh, tablet who's called Elegante. Uh, and he's very famous and he's made a lot of money, I think. And, <laughs> and that's important because th that was a, an opportunity that technology gives you. But also, I think that inside, used inside the classrooms and, 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 and as tools for the teachers, they're very important. For, we, we've developed a... a a tool to assessing children for for assessing children uh, learning um, uh, reading precursors and and, and the factors that, that you need to have and and this is we're rolling uh, that in, on the country. I mean, like every teacher will have access to that that tool, so they can quickly assess the the, the state the, of their classroom and and even if they are very. And we're trying to adapt to different contexts because we have, as Julia said, there's not one single poverty thing and, and there's a huge variability. So we need to adjust many things, but our tools are being used also in Argentina. So this is important because uh, one thing that, that came out of research recently, I would say, like we, we knew that before, but I think that if teachers know how they, they, they really know, I mean, like they, they know for every child, uh, where they are, what they know, and that, what they don't know, that enhances education. And and if they have some knowledge of what they expect to, they should be doing in a sense that we know there's there's a, there's a, a problem with the diversity argument, which is that you can say, okay, everyone is diverse. Why should all why should all we learn how to read? Or let's be diverse. But this is dangerous. Everyone should know how to read. And maybe you can read many different things and the books you like are different, but reading is very important and math is very important. Reason is very important. So um, social adjustment and social cognition is very important. There are many things that you need to, to learn. And so knowing what, what it takes to learn some things and tools to assess how the children are doing, and uh, it's, it's, it's the, the first thing you need to have. And it's very complicated to do so in, in massive classrooms and when you have 40 children and, and a lot of variability. And so having these tools is the first step. <clears throat> and, and technology makes that quite easy. I mean, like 
you don't have to have pencil and paper and people correcting all the pencil and paper tests and whatever. So this is a you can apply uh, screeners that can tell you quickly if there are some children that are having problems and are lagging behind and require extra attention or different approaches. And so th that's one thing connected to that. The, the the personalization of the learning experiences is that what we're trying to to move forward, like the, to have the um, every child should have access to the things that connecting this with with games in, in a sense that you can gamify or, or create games that relate to the, the their own experience or, or what they like. You have a, a variability. You, we want to create a variety of, of games and, and, and experiences children can have so they can learn. You can put something to learn in different settings so the teachers can say, okay, you can play that game or follow that book or some uh, didactic feature and will help you and we're trying to to personalize that and that's why technology is very important i mean you can do that you can play with your tablet or have your tablet and the other your friend here is using another one although we know also know that that social interactions using the tablets or or real games is very important too let me keep uh that's something Vygotsky told us. I mean, uh, the learning is social. So maybe some social, uh, you, you, you can promote social games or social activities for learning with the, the tablets and the technologies. <clears throat> and um, well, and, and that's, I mean, um, we can also teach the teachers with uh, uh, technologies, but this is another, another issue we're trying to move on. So, um, um, what I want to say is that, okay, maybe technology requires a, a, a particular setting, but nowadays technology is quite cheap. So you can have pl places where you can, um, you know, uh, charge your computer or your cell phone or your device, wh whatever you have. And you can have places where you have, there, there's a, a tendency to generalize internet access at least in in my country, but in several places, in, the, in, in, in even in, in our region, and that's that are important um, uh, in public policies that can have an impact if you use them properly. Again, I don't believe that just uh, dropping some computer every every place uh, here and there will help uh, anyone. I mean, you need you need to plan that. You have, you need to create content. You need to to. You need teachers that know how to use that and and to for profit and and I think that every every technological application comes with the, the same results. It says, okay, if, if teachers know how to use that, it helps a lot, and 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 we can and if we put the the relevant science in the design of the of the of the tools. I mean, the, not anything, not, not everything works. I mean, the, there are some things that don't work at all. And okay, yeah, that's that's a, an interesting research that connects cognitive science with technology and human computer interfaces and, and human technology interface. And, and that's an area that we're trying to develop. <clears throat> but I think that that's feasible and we know better. We are not so naive nowadays. We don't believe that only technology, but we are doing a lot of things in that in that same area. And I think that uh, Latin America and, and the, the non the non weird countries are also important in 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 that sense for testing for trying to new new ideas and new tools and new mm. strategies. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you because you know a lot about all these studies that looked at uh, technology in education and um, within the Latin America. Did you see anything that worked or didn't work differently? from the studies that have been conducted in Western countries? Well, we, we tried to say something in, in the book, I mean, and but was more connected to our experience and, 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 and prejudice, I would say, that um, you have to be very careful of, of what you put in. I mean, you have to develop the, 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 the tools in, in interaction with the, with the people working there because the, if you, you we have we used uh, some games that were developed in, in not in our country, for instance, uh, in France, and we adapted them to Spanish and say, okay, this is Spanish. We put Spanish. The learning is universal. Let's go to the schools. But schools, 
have teachers and people uh, concerned about children education and learning. So they are doing things. Uh, they are doing things in their own environment. So they, if you go there with, with your own prejudice and say, okay, you should le learn that and this and these are your problems. No, no, maybe their problems are uh, uh, somewhere else. And, and they are doing what you, you think they should be doing in another way. And you come with a technology that doesn't help at all. Well, that happened to us. I mean, uh, we went, we did a project and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and the problem was that the teachers were already doing what we thought our technology could, could help them to do. And they know and they liked it and then they say, okay, we can use that, but we're doing this in the same time. So we're, I'm, I'm not, um, and maybe if you do that in, in the States or, or other places where the, the, there's a lot of, of, there's a lot of controversy about, for instance, learning how to read, uh, maybe you put that and you can change something. And, but this doesn't happen here in the sense that, uh, when you are working in poverty, I mean, you're a teacher working in a very complex environment. You try to do, I mean, you try your, really your best and, and you try to go. There's an, an interesting thing here. I mean, like there's a national curriculum in, for children how, learning how to read, which is quite based on, and I would say, outdated constructivist uh, thinking. And, um, but it, when we went with our project to to enhance uh, or help them with the education of with teaching how to read, for instance, and um, teachers in this uh, low SES uh, settings were not following any of the the curriculum guidelines, and they say this doesn't work here. We know, we know, we already know that. So they were, they were more advanced in a sense in their knowledge than the curriculum makers. I can, I, I told that to the authorities. They didn't like that much, but no. But <laughs> the, the thing is that the teachers they say I, I store the books they they, they give me, and so the, there's a national organization they gave them books and blah blah blah. So I, I store the, the the books they give me, and so I only take them out when the, the inspectors come to see what we're doing, say, oh, here we have, and then we do other things. And, and they liked a lot the applications we had because, ah, this is what we do. This, we do this. And so sometimes we have some political problems and, and, and given the, the backup the teachers know really require and, and the confidence that they are doing things that are right and then, then they are based on science, and that, that's a, a, also an important thing. So maybe that doesn't happen in the in the north. I don't know. <clears throat> and, and here you have these extreme things and extreme cases that that you need to address, and and really you you can be make a huge difference in that sense. And so also we are not doing exactly the same as in the in the central. I mean. Uh, English speaking or French speaking countries because there their, their language system is different and the writing system is different. So we have to adapt many things. And so that's why we are, of course, there's Spanish in, in, in Europe also. And they do, and we collaborate with uh, Manolo Carreiras from the Basque Center. I mean, we're not doing, you know, a revolution of, of the styles of reading, but I, I think that there are some differences you have to take into account. And in, in particular, you have to take into account the differences in the social setting. I mean, you, ha you, don't, you have to be very careful and not be uh, naive and, you know, prejudiced and, and, and pre prejudge what you're going to, to find in the, in the field. I mean, uh, we found something in the field. They, they had problems with other things. They had problems with access to books. They had problems with access with the... Teachers not, uh, with children not going to the to the schools and and, and many absent uh, days and problems to of access, but they they and maybe they didn't have enough resources to run the technological tools, so we wanted to help them do that. But the the basic thing we, we thought we were bringing to the schools was not the was not the the research thing that they already discovered somehow uh, by trial and error and and by basing on. on I mean, I would say something which might sound uh, controversial, but some of the things that the the readings, the, the science of reading has discovered is that you have to teach, and then teaching is important, and, and teaching in a sense, some traditional way of teaching how to read and write is is the way to go. So, 
<laughs> I would say that we, we went in circles, but we are here again, and that's important, but we, we can sustain that with a, a lot of science nowadays. Thank you. Can you tell us more about the attention is affected by the cultural differences? Yes, yes. When you, uh, attention is a function that is kind of uh, hard sometimes to work because a lot of things can change attention. A lot of things will mess with attention. And of course, if a lot of things mess, mess with attention or cultural perspectives will mess, mess with attention. Basically, we have uh, in the book, we talk about the development uh, point of attention. We talk about nutrition. We talk about you know um, when the when your brain gets you know mature. But we also can talk about context, right? Because let's talk about schools. So I'm here in Brazil right now, and in Brazil, you have a lot of good schools, but you also have a lot of bad schools that don't have structure, and you have schools that don't. You have schools that when it rains, you have you know, leak a, a dripping in the, in the middle of the classroom. And you, and you know when you are at home and your sink is dripping, it's leaking, you can concentrate in anything. Now think about this in the classroom. Some schools don't have boards. Some schools don't have, you know, necessary sound, you know, management to 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 the teacher can, so, he, so he can uh, teach without noise this i'm not talking about brain right now i'm talking about function if you have a lot of things get getting your attention that is not related with the the class subject you will you will lose information and how we can think about people that will you know leave they pass through this this design in their life they, they can uh they, they they trying to learn but they can because the context not helping so when we have think about attention, we have to think about context, but we also think about our internal context. So it's easier for us, anyone, to focus on things that we care, right? So when we have, when we care about something, we focus on that. And, uh, and when we have this complex, you know, relation, uh, uh, cultural relation like violence, stress, anxiety, that is related with uh, a bad nutrition, that is related with violence. Sometimes we won't want to learn about math or Portuguese. We, we don't care. So that's another thing. And to finish this, this question here is uh, sleep. If you can't sleep, you can pay attention to anything. So in Brazil, we have this, in Latin America, we have this kind of uh, situation that uh, students don't sleep well because they have a lot of brothers or some 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 of them are poor or they are living through violence every day. Of course, I'm not saying that everyone is, is like that in Brazil. It's, it's a group, but we need to check on them. We need to understand what's happened then to understand what's happened with their attention. So basically it's that. Uh, our culture will affect the way we pay attention to things. Uh, I don't know how, how it is in the UK, but I must say, if you are watching a class uh, in, in Brazil and a car, you know, just make some noise, sometimes you will get anxious because it can be related with uh, uh, shooting. Not a, not all place, of course, but some place, yes. So that's, that's kind of important to understand. Top down and bottom up attention, basically. Amazing. Um, to wrap up this talk, I was wondering, does any of you have any final thoughts or takeaways that you would want to give to the public regarding evidence-based education, regarding the brain sciences, regarding Latin America, this perspective on all of that we talked about, anything that you would like to share with our listeners? Uh, I don't think... Uh... I have any important things to be added because we have told all of them. But to summarize what has already been said here, um, diversity is important. We feel we have good
good quality work that should be considered. Sometimes we feel ignored, unnecessarily ignored. Not all of us, not all the people ignore us, but sometimes we think uh, Latin American work deserves more consideration. Uh, why? Because for a number of reasons, some things that the things that have been shown in weird countries to be uh, to be scientifically robust should be also proven in non-weird countries. Uh, and the thing, and maybe they will not work because, uh, well, because of the lot of difference that we have mentioned here. And if they work, much more better. We we are nearer a kind of truth if something like that exists. But uh, like uh, that's it. I think it's, that's it. So just one other thing. I mean that w w one thing that diversity shows is that things are complex. I mean that there are some very simplified models, and when you try to to use that in the in the in the field, that, that's what we try to do all the time here. They are not so they don't work that perfectly and so that i think that cognitive sciences are realizing about that i mean that they're, they're starting to understand that and they are looking towards us in a sense that i i hopefully that they they come to us uh because we have many things to say and and that th this this complexity is that that we have to i mean i don't want to ha to hide to hide things be uh, behind complexity it's important to have theories and understanding, and we 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 strive for understanding. We want to have understanding, but this understanding needs to take everything of all of this into account. And, and um, I think we are, we have a in the, in our book and 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 in the papers, many of our colleagues here in, in the global south are having are, are speaking of a, a new kind of truth and, and uh, makes the the theories more complex than. I think the, the mainstream cognitive science tend to think. I, I, I want to thank you for this interview because when we publish a book, we feel sometimes, or a paper or something like that, we feel sometimes that no one is reading. You know, we think like, oh, I published, but no one is reading. And it's really nice to see uh, that people are reading. And uh, you in UK are reading and, uh, and uh, it's really good to see that you are thinking about it, and especially, uh, I'm I'm with my heart, you know, warm because it's really good to see students from the UK caring about a book uh, from a Latin American perspective. I think this is really important to you know help communication, help to do better science, help to do better better find better evidence. So I want to thank you. And I want to also to ask you, when you read the book, do not think only about a book with the experiments and with you know research. Think about a book, book of people, because every every sample that every participant, every writer, author has a history that is really important to this product. So. Don't read that. Don't read like a paper. Read like a book of stories, a book of you know uh, experience. Amazing! I think that's a really beautiful note to uh, end this talk on. Thank you so much for sharing all, all your knowledge with us and all your um, viewpoints on psychology, evidence-based education, and brain sciences. Um, I wish you all the best with your future publications and work. And once more, thank you so much for sharing with us. Wow, such an interesting and eye-opening discussion. We hope you agree. In this episode, our experts have highlighted some of the specific challenges and differences working within the Latin American context and the impact that these have on our understanding of the brain and the way we learn. More than anything, they have demonstrated the profound blind spot that exists within psychology as a science due to its over-reliance on samples from so-called weird populations. 
We would like to end by offering our sincere thanks to our guests for sharing their time and expertise with us. And thank you to you, the listeners, for helping us to support Brain Awareness Week 2023.